And speaking of uh, image, what was the face President Trump was making last night when Biden was talking? What was, was I like call his, it resting Trump face. What was that? It just, it just he's kind of um, pinchy. Um, I don't have a way of describing no, that scowl. Uh, but I, I thought that uh, in regards to communication last night, obviously. Trump was Trump, and uh, Joe Biden was not the Joe Biden who debated no. Paul Ryan, what was that, 12 years ago yeah. now? Uh, big difference. We've uh, brought in for some expert commentary on uh, the telephone from uh, the Republican side, Delegate Elias Coop Gonzalez. Coop, good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And Sam Petsonk on the Democratic side. Sam, good morning to you as well. Good morning to you, Rob and Bill and uh, Mr. Gilstrap. Good to be with you all. Sam, I want to begin with you first because of the two performances last night. Uh, I thought President Biden's, at least his first half hour, I thought he got a little steam going there in the middle half hour. Uh, but that first half hour was troubling for many. What was uh, your reaction in watching that? Well, my, my reaction to the debate was, frustration and shock at Mr. Trump, who was, you know, predictably lying and refusing to accept the results of the elections and refusing to stand behind his terrible record of destabilizing the, you know, the, the world order and danger, endangering democracy. I mean, that to, to, I can't get away from that. It, it is so disturbing to me. I'm, I, you know, I'm, we all know that, that, uh, you know, President Biden is uh, has foggy moments. He's 80 years old. That's not, in my experience, that's not a news flash. You know, I I just can't believe. So my every moment of that debate for me was: Are we really going to let Donald Trump come back to hand global power to Putin and the Koreans? I mean, that I just was shaking my head, uh, frankly, all night long. <laughs> But, Sam, I want you to concentrate on your candidate for a moment. I know you're in, over this next 20 minutes you're going to be bringing it against uh, President Trump, but you have to tell me as a Democrat, and I know you're a loyal one, uh, how are you sitting this morning with uh, President Biden as your nominee? Because there are many Democrats who have been on TV over the last 12 hours who don't seem very comfortable about it. Well, you know, I worked in Washington, D.C. for several years, Uh I was around all kinds of leaders. I know that we have systems in this country for uh, for managing, uh, you know, uh, an orderly democratic process of governance. Uh, Joe Biden has has succeeded in a historic fashion. Hundreds of billions of dollars, as Senator Byrd used to say, that's billions with a B. Uh, for infrastructure, for uh, economic opportunity all over this country. I mean, the, when you look at President Biden, his record is one of unmitigated, unvarnished success. And he has, you know, not only uh, has he succeeded in the rebuilding American, you know, manufacturing, uh, notwithstanding his age, because I hear you, you want to, you want to consider his age and it's a valid consideration, but look, I mean, heck, Ronald Reagan had dementia throughout the 1980s and he got a lot done and nobody ever questioned that, you know, I mean, and he, he had outright Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, the, the thing that matters is uh, people bring all sorts of, of life experience to public service. And yes, President Biden is a little bit older, but you have to look at his ability to govern, and that's really what what, what is at stake. I mean, and going forward, you know, we heard President Biden talk about the three key issues, frankly, that ha that I'm concerned about in West Virginia. Number one, the crisis in the affordability of child care and elder care. I mean, you want to talk about the elderly? President Biden mentioned, we, uh, you know, we have a crisis. Our families cannot afford to pay to care for their elderly. It is it is a massive economic challenge holding back our households. And Biden talked about that. I mean, he did, you know. He focused on that. He mentioned child care and elder care. Um, 
It's, you know, Rob, uh, the, for the last decade, and it's expected for the next decade in West Virginia, the leading area of new job opportunities is in direct care for the elderly and for children. That's because our economy has such a massive need for those services, and uh, we can't access them right now. And so, you know, there's an urgent economic need for President Biden to be reelected, to do what he said last night is his top priority, which is, you know, uh, turning around this economy, making it more affordable by by um, eliminating this biggest cost that most families are are really struggling with in, in, in Sam, terms of the elder care. Yeah, uh, hold it, hang in there now, Coop. Uh, yeah. let, me, let me get your reaction one to President uh, Trump's performance and uh, to your observations on the debate in general. Yeah, well, I think uh, obviously President Trump did a good job. Uh, another thing I'd like to note is, is just his overall appearance. He looked uh, very calm, cool, collected. Uh, He was able to gather his thoughts and articulate them uh, very well. And I think I think President Trump has been able to take some of the criticisms that he's received in the past for, you know, maybe being too aggressive or going down uh, some tangents or or name calling and things like that. And he he's really done a good job of giving the people what they want. And that's really just talking about the issues. And I think from a West Virginia perspective, it's really important to to pay attention to these two candidates, particularly on on some issues like energy, for example, because energy is is so important to everybody. But particularly for us, we have uh, coal that we export and we have one candidate who has vowed to protect the coal industry. And and when I talk about uh, energy, I, I also I also uh, say that uh, being mindful towards the environment, of course, the technology that we have today allows us to burn coal in a very clean fashion. But the other side doesn't really care about that. They want to they want to build windmills and they want to have solar panels all over the place. Heck, I was I was driving through the eastern panhandle recently and I saw solar panels all over and. I think that if if Biden continues to be president, it'll put West Virginia down uh, to its knees. And that, that'll be a very sad thing. Bill, let me go to you now first. Yeah. Uh, good morning, folks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, Sam, I appreciate your loyalty to uh, uh, to uh, President Biden, but it's unescapable that the performance last night was was really, really bad. I can find other adjectives I want to use, but it's really, really bad. A question that I asked you the other day, and I gave you an opportunity to kind of run away from it, but it's even more real today than it was last Wednesday when we spoke, is what are the Democrats going to do? Based upon last night's performance by President Biden, the chance of the Democrats winning uh, has been reduced. They were already behind, but even more so. Now you're going to look at the downstream candidates. The Democrats got to take some action, take it fairly quick. What are they going to do besides just run the course, which is going to be a course toward disaster? Uh, well, Bill, you're right. I mean, there, this is an urgent election for Democrats. It's about reproductive freedom, child care, and democracy. I mean, those are all three urgent issues, and the Democrats want to spare not an inch to ensure that we win this election to address those urgent concerns. So, uh, you know, right now uh, the uh, polling that I've seen is all neck and neck. Um, the Democrats, as we discussed the other day, have reformed our, our nominating process so that it's more transparent and accountable. Uh, really, uh, the voters have spoken. That, that's the way our democracy works. So two things can happen going forward. I mean, the, the, the delegates will come to the convention in Chicago in August. They have committed. It's a transparent, democratic commitment. The voters have spoken. All those delegates are committed to voting for President Biden. So they're going to do that. That's the that's what I expect will happen. Now, if God forbid, you know, President Biden is is, is unable to serve or, or doesn't go forward, then those delegates would be released. But those are the only two things that can happen. And, and, and you know, that's the way our democracy works. John Gilstrap. Yeah, I <clears throat> I understand partisanship, and I understand the need, the, the, the drive for party to win. You know, everybody wants their side to, to win the fight. But 
you know, I just want to lift this is a poll quote from uh, the debate last night when the president said that he is committed to, quote, making sure we make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we had to do with, look, we finally beat Medicare. Uh, that is not cogent thought. Uh, and yeah, let's stipulate that he did a lot of good things in his first couple of years. Let's stipulate that he was a good senator. I don't think he was, but for the sake of argument, we'll stipulate to that. Uh, we're talking about the future of the free world here, and we can we can talk about policy, we can talk about campaign points, but let's talk about the actual performance in the debate, and let's talk about a window into uh, what looked like a doddering old man. And perhaps we now know why the White House or the Justice Department refuses to release the recording, uh, that we already have the transcript from the Her report. Maybe now we know why we don't have the recording from from the her report so i would like to refocus back to both of you gentlemen to discuss not so much policy points this is I don't, not a campaign speech but talk about the actual performance of of it within the debate itself if the the polling that comes after this shows that there's a big problem with the democratic support for biden is there a choice, or is this is just a is this just a march into Armageddon, assuming that that there's a big turn against President Biden because of this? Is it just a a, a, a march into a loss, or is there is there no choice? Are you asking that question? I to guess Sam? I'm asking it to Sam. Well, look, uh, um, John. I mean, the uh, this. You're right about one thing there. I really think you're very much right. This election is about our, the, the fortitude of our democracy. And you know, that includes, that requires that we respect the democratic prerogatives of the people. And so, you know, we've had our primary elections. Um, there is a process that, that by which uh, we nominate our our presidential candidates, and, th and and we can't just discard that process. In fact, President Trump would like us to discard that. He said last night, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'll respect the results of the election, maybe not. He kind of did one of his little, you know, head wags. And, uh, but that's not okay. That's, uh, that is a very disturbing uh, uh, norm that Trump has introduced into American politics, and we should reject it. We should reject Trump because he's doing that, and we should say, hey, Biden, regardless of his age, received the support of the voters, and, uh, and if, you know, if he's willing and able to go forward as a candidate, that's what our democracy has decided. And I think you're right. We better stick to our guns or this democracy will evaporate real quickly before our, our eyes. And it's a scary that's a scary thought. Coop, is the uh, lack of accountability from President Trump on January the 6th, he dodged it three different ways to Sunday last night. Does that bother you at all? Because it bothered me. Yeah, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't actually see it as a lack of accountability. Uh, when you actually look at the facts in that in that uh, scenario, Nancy Pelosi did have the authority to have National Guard troops to surround the Capitol. And President Trump offered those resources to her. He, he offered, the I, I believe it was 15,000 uh, National Guardsmen to go and stand by the Capitol, and she said no. And not only that, but if you go all the way back in time and you look at President Trump's tweets, you can even go on there now. I think he's only tweeted once or twice in that entire uh, a four-year period since then, he said very clearly that people should go and be peaceful. Um, I think it, it's very clear that the, uh, the Democrats have taken this and become extremely fixated on it, blown it way out of proportion. And honestly, they've taken some people who were totally peaceful on January 6th. They, they walked in. They were completely respectful. They didn't break anything. And those people were, were put in jail. They've been in jail. No bail. No court or anything like that, totally unconstitutional. I think that's really where the lack of accountability is. The Constitution is being completely ignored, and you've got 70-year-old grandmas who are sitting in prison who may never, ever see their grandkids again. 
of, you know, because they're just fixated on, on this one event and they're trying to squeeze every last drop of juice to try and attack Republicans and President Trump over this. And President Trump really does not bear the responsibility on this. Coop, do you uh, believe that uh, Vice President Pence reached out to him for assistance while that assault was going on? Well, I, I cannot speak uh, directly to what happened between them privately because I, I wasn't there. So I, I can't really I can't comment on that. Well, you, you commented on all the grandmothers that are in prison and you haven't been there to visit them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I haven't been there to visit them, but it is well documented that they are there and they're going through that. How many now, of, how many of the January yeah. 6th, quote unquote, hostages are 70 year old grandmas? Coop? Yeah. If you want a specific number, I, I don't have one, but you can find several tangible examples out there. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, Biden. Well, well, hold on before you before you jump off this, because you opened up the door to this, Coop, not me. When I was watching my highlights on TV that day, I didn't see a lot of 70-year-old grandmas scaling the walls and breaking into the Capitol that day. Sure. Well, I mean, they weren't scaling the walls, but, uh, you know, and, and saying breaking in, I'm not saying that there weren't a few people who, who uh, were agitators and, and maybe broke a few things, but there are videos, it is well documented, that the doors were open for them in many cases. There were Capitol Police that opened the doors and allowed people in. And there are people that simply walked in, including the 70-year-old grandmas, other people, all walks of life, by the way, that went in. And they've been put in prison and been, been treated totally unfairly. Wow. And I, I really don't think that if they were Democrats, they would have been treated that way. Because over 2020, we saw tons and tons of crimes being committed. People don't remember that the White House was surrounded when President Trump was president. And, and there were Democrats throwing things at Secret Service agents. Many of them were injured, by the way, and nothing really happened. There wasn't, there wasn't some congressional uh, a response, some committee where they where it was totally lopsided, where they had like a ratio of six to, six to one uh, or six Democrats to one Republican on the committees. And I just think it's, a, it's really unfair to try and, and frame it that way towards President Trump. And I, I think the whole situation is a travesty. And I say that recognizing that there were some people there who did cause some trouble, but I, I don't think that this situation has been uh, looked at correctly. Bill, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, man, we're walking down a path that's been re been addressed many, many times for the last three or four years. We each have a silo. We're going to stay in a silo, yeah. and regardless of what anybody says, we're staying in a silo. But the issue at hand is what we saw last night. And, and Sam, as much as I respect you, I think what I'm hearing this morning is spin. The Democrats are going to have to face up to the fact that last night's performance – was exceptionally damaging and the polls that we had before the debate are going to look markedly different than the polls after the debate the democrats are going to have to face up to this otherwise it's going to be a train wreck now, bill, I, 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 hear, mind, I hear what you're I, saying i hear what you're saying bill but my point there is to say the you know the, the way the democrats We'll have a limited number of choices going forward because we respect our democracy. The voters have spoken. I mean, we could say if, if President Biden did not want to seek reelection, he could have made that decision. And he, but he didn't because of, he knew that he had beaten Trump before and he knew what was on the line. And then the voters had a chance to agree or disagree in the primary. And and, you know, that I mean, Trump is an existential threat to our democracy and the, 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 we, our democracy is working its will in order to defeat uh, President Trump. And, you know, it's uh, he's we've we've just we've got to stick to our democratic process. Uh, if, if we don't, we don't have America anymore. We, we don't have our freedom. We certainly won't have reproductive freedom. We won't have economic opportunity. You know, this election is about do we defend our democracy, which means supporting the Democratic nominee or, or do we abandon our democracy? Sam, I don't I don't know if if you're missing the point or you're hearing the point. And uh, if, in fact, you Trump is an existential threat um, and you truly believe that I don't. But if you do, then what you're saying is you are guaranteeing the destruction 
of democracy because there is there is no way to keep Biden from becoming the uh, Democratic nominee. He's already polling badly, and tomorrow it, the last night did not help him at all. So what you're what I what I'm hearing is he is absolutely the nominee. There's no changing that, and and here we go. Would you guys mind if, if sure, uh, go ahead, I could make some points? I, I, the, the January 6th thing came up, and, and uh, we spent some time on that. But I did want to uh, be able to, to talk about some things that I observed yesterday that were really important. And, you know, it, when, we, when lies are made on the debate stage, I think it shouldn't just generally be said, you know, this candidate, you know, said lies or whatever. We should look at those statements specifically. And President Biden, he said that the uh, Border Patrol Union endorsed him. Well, as soon as that was said, the Border Patrol Union went on, on X, formerly known as Twitter, and they said, quote, to be clear, we have we never have and never will endorse Biden. That was a total, total flat out lie. And on top of that, he, President Biden was talking about how you know he's been so good on the border and all this. It was total gaslighting, total gaslighting. The Border Patrol Union further went on to say a few hours later, he said, Biden claimed this morning that the congressional Republicans have blocked its hiring of thousands of Border Patrol agents. In reality, Republicans have actually funded more agents in recent appropriation bills in spite of Biden, not because of him. So President Biden going in there and, and trying to you know, frame himself as some guy who actually cares about the border is just not true. And not only that, but I've actually spoken to international officials. I spoke to uh, the Secretary of International Affairs from Guatemala, they said that the Biden administration doesn't even return any of their phone calls. They are absolutely engaged in dereliction of duty over the border. And Coop, and, on, on that note, I'm just about yeah. running out of time. I'll have to use that as your final word. Sam, you've got 20 seconds to wrap it up. What do you have for me? Uh, what, ha what Biden did for the border is he backed the bipartisan border deal, which the Border Patrol Union endorsed. So Biden has delivered on immigration, on the economy, on defending democracy, reproductive freedom, child care, and everything this country needs. And that's Biden's legacy, and that's why we urgently need to reelect him. And, you know, guys, Sam, I mean— Sam, that, that, yeah. that'll have to be it for you, buddy. I'm out of time. Thank you, my friend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Sam, kindly. Sam Petzonk and Coop Gonzalez. Thanks so much, both of you. Delegate uh, last Coop Gonzalez there. And we break for the uh, uh, bottom of the hour here. And the segment brought to you by Hagerstown Ford and by Berkeley County Health Department and the free rate on test kits. Life is evolving. Over the past decade, the way we do almost everything has changed. Get on your phone, see something you like, click on it, and it shows up at your door. Why should the way you have your car serviced be any different? Why waste your time going to a dealership service department when Hager Sound Ford and Hancock Chevrolet will come to you? They service all makes, all models, and offer full parts and labor warranties. Hager Sound Ford and Hancock Chevrolet will come to your door or office and service your vehicle while you're doing what you need to be doing, conducting that business meeting or mowing the lawn. Why take time out of your busy schedule when you don't have to? Hagerstown Ford and Hancock Chevrolet's friendly, knowledgeable staff will come to you where you live or where you work for full service maintenance. From oil changes to tire rotations, brakes, batteries, multi-point inspections, they handle it all. Hagerstown Ford and Hancock Chevrolet is committed to delivering the best of the best to their customers. Trust them to service your vehicle where you're at, at home or at work. Skip the time-consuming and terminal wait at the dealership. Schedule your appointment at FordofHagerstown.com or HancockChevy.com. The WVU Heart and Vascular Institute is pleased to announce that thoracic surgery with Dr. Shalini Reddy is now available in Martinsburg at WVU Medicine Berkeley Medical Center. Dr. Reddy has practiced thoracic surgery in the region for over eight years and offers robotic laparoscopic surgeries for the lungs, esophagus, and more. For more information about thoracic surgery in Martinsburg, check us out online at mywvuheart.com. Welcome back to Golden Nation Buffet. I'm Ryan Smetzer and I'm so excited to show you guys the endless selection of sushi right here in our restaurant. Here at Golden Nation Buffet, they have got the finest selection of rolled sushi. Our chefs prepare with only the freshest ingredients to make sure that you have the best sushi experience imaginable. So come on over to Golden Asian Buffet and check out their finest selection of incredible and fresh sushi. We'll see you soon.
Did you know that anybody can have lunch at Berkeley Senior Center? Hello, this is Amy Orndoff, Executive Director at Berkeley Senior Services. We serve a healthy, nutritious, and delicious lunch five days a week at 217 North High Street in Martinsburg. For seniors age 60 and up, the charge is by donation only, and for those under 60, it's just $7.25. And while you're here for lunch, take a look at all of our great programs and activities. Find out more, including our daily menu, at berkeleyseniorservices.org or by calling 263-8873. We look forward to serving you. When you are looking for the perfect gift, look no further than L.A. Roberts Jewelers at 146 North Queen Street in downtown Martinsburg. Choose from a huge selection of unique items from the finest diamonds that make your eyes sparkle to exquisite timepieces, figurines, and collectibles. Buying from L.A. Roberts Jewelers means that you've made the decision to do business with people who've excelled in the industry for more than 100 years. They'll be here tomorrow when you need them, and if you need your jewelry or your watch repaired, they'll do that too. L.A. Roberts in downtown Martinsburg. Old World Jewelers for a new age. Hi, Cresha Hornby here. Larry DeMarco, broker of Modern Realty Results, believes he has some